Thank you very much. We hadn't been at this business very long before we discovered this. This wasn't a very good uh, hour in which to give long sermons, so we're going to leave that for later in the year, and we're going to give you sort of short sermons today. There's one thing, however, that we need to get straight before we do anything, and it has to do with this Steve and Marie business. Some of you were here last week, I mean last year, you probably were here last week, but uh, some of you were here last year when Pat and I, just to sort of lighten up the hour a little bit, just make you relax, we, we told this little story about Steve Craig and Marie Osmond. It was essentially a true story, essentially, <laughs> <coughs> that we had in fact been sort of marched into a movie theater stride for stride with them and uh, kind of ended up at the front of the hall. Well, everyone took it so seriously, especially Steve and Marie. Uh, I began to worry when I saw things getting serious between them, and I wanted to run out in the street and say, uh, look, it was a joke, really just a little humor. It was just a sort of a BYU story. But no, I run out into the street, and there are people backed up from the Hotel Utah Ballroom to Bryce Canyon waiting uh, to get into the reception. There had, in fact, been a marriage. All the Osmond brothers were there, the basketball team. They'd, they'd really taken it seriously. And we feel so responsible. <laughs> but for all of that, we are available for a price. Uh, If you make it worth our while, we will tell your story <laughs> here in this setting. All you have to do is write on a Wheaties box top in 25 <laughs> words or less who it is you want to be seen with, and we'll, we'll take it from there. Now you watch. Some wise guy in this audience is going to send us a Wheaties box top <laughs> and probably a registration form for the Hotel Utah Ballroom. Speaking of strange students, <laughs> which one of you did I see pulling into town, I guess it was Friday, with a surfboard through the sunroof of your Volkswagen? <laughs> I don't, I don't want to be a spoil sport on the first day of school, but someone has seriously misled you about that canal that runs in front of <laughs> Heritage Halls. I'd be as pleased as you will be to have Sister Holland speak to you and give you a greeting. I mentioned last year something her father had said about me. I didn't tell you what her mother said about me. <laughs> On our wedding day, wonderful sweet girl that she is, she said to her mother, I am so excited. This has to be the perfect day. I do not want the least significant thing overlooked. At which point her mother said, I'm sure that Jeff will be there. I just want Jeff to remember and never forget that the penalty of bigamy is two mothers-in-law. <laughs> when I was just 16 years old, I came to Provo for the summer to study music on this campus. I lived in Chipman Hall of Helaman Halls, and I practiced the organ every morning in the basement of the Joseph Smith Building, and I ate enormous amounts of pizza in what is now the brick oven on 8th North and 1st East. And I'm afraid at that tender age I was more interested in boys and what I should wear to the dance on Friday than anything of any real value or substance. <laughs> You're smarter than I thought you were. <laughs> that summer was a major turning point in my life, and this campus has had deep personal meaning for me since that summer of 1958. You see, I began to hear and see and feel things I had never experienced before. 
Looking back then from this perspective, I now know that because of this university setting, my mind was beginning to open to the glory of God's. For the first time, I was conscious of the relationship between his glory and his mind. Reflecting on that special experience while worrying and searching my heart for something of value to leave with you today, the scripture of John 5 and 40 has come to have bright new meaning for me. And I quote, Ye will not come unto me that ye might have life. What does he mean when he scold, softly scolds us? Ye will not come unto me that ye will have life. I don't think he's just talking about life eternal, though that too. I think he is speaking about here and now. I think he's speaking about a constant feeling of well-being and a thanksgiving for our very existence. I think he is saying we search everywhere else for it first. We search for it in the praise of men, in worldly pleasures, and in worldly treasures in clothing, in dances, and enormous amounts of pizza, while all the time he is crying, Come unto me, and ye will have life. In our 16-year-old son Matt's seminary class, the teacher was trying to explain that to be constantly nourished by the word of the Lord was as binding and sustaining of life as that umbilical cord between a mother and a child. The teacher then asked the class, what tangible resource do we have that is as equally sustaining to us as this umbilical cord? Now, I'm sure the teacher was in hopes that the class would respond with reading the scriptures and prayer and being obedient and so on. But our 16-year-old son, Matt, with his kind of laid-back sense of humor, raised his hand and said, could it be an angelical cord? <laughs> as many a truth is said in jest, Matt's analogy is the best I can think of to describe literally the life the Lord can give to us through a tie that is as firm and sustaining as any we are willing to allow. It is something heavenly, even angelic, and it can turn darkness to light and death to light. Now, what does this have to do with you here, eager this morning to start your first year at BYU? Since marriage, my husband and I have lived in many different places, and we've studied at several institutions of higher learning, many of the best in this nation. However, never have we found one so rich and so fertile in finding God and in finding ourselves as here at BYU. This university is a veritable banquet table laden with all that can sustain life if you come to it hungering and thirsting for it. My husband has had on several occasions the opportunity to speak around the country, and he has chosen to talk about our educational heritage and the values which every school should espouse. Did you know that the earliest statement of educational aim at Harvard University declared, everyone shall consider the main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life." Close quote. Of the nine colleges founded during that colonial period, all nine of them were sponsored by Christian churches. However, it was during that 19th century when education was becoming divorced from organized religion that the Latter-day Saints began this university refusing to follow that national trend. As Elder George Q. Morris, a member of the Council of the Twelve, once said, it is called the Brigham Young University, but it is the university for the kingdom of God. You see, you are the kingdom of God, and you're here to be nurtured and tutored for your service in the world. John A. Woodso, who once served on the faculty of BYU and was later president of both Utah State and the University of Utah, from which he was appointed to the Council of the Twelve, 
wrote, There are many institutions of learning which foster splendidly the learning gains of the century, but there is only one offering full collegiate training. Brigham Young University, in which the wisdom of men is saturated and, note, alive, there is that word again, saturated and made alive with the wisdom of the gospel of Jesus Christ, close quote. I guess I'm here today to bear my witness to the truth that the men and women, the knowledge of your teachers, your faculty, the staff, the administrators at this university, are made alive with the wisdom of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in order for you to taste all that there is here to offer you, you may have to make sure your angelical cord is secure. I would like you to know that the president of this university, for all of his fun and good sense of humor, spends hours and hours night and day, diligently laboring to know the mind and the will of the Lord as he tries to steer the destiny of this university and help the Church. In closing, may I just say to you very, very personally, there are only a few truly irreplaceable experiences you can have in this world. One of these, for me, has been that the Lord has allowed me to give life to my own three children. The love that I felt as I realized it was my body and my strength and my constant nourishment that was giving life to my children formed a bond that is like nothing else in this world unless it is that that is extended to us from our Father in Heaven. You see, once you have given life, you never stop giving to it. I have tried to give my children comfort when my own heart was aching, and I've tried to encourage my children when my life seemed very, very confused, and I have tried to give love when I knew that love might not be returned. Like every mother, I have learned something about the link between life and love. No wonder Nephi came to know that the tree of life was literally the love of God. Now, I love you very much, and I want your lives to be rich and full, not just this year, but always. May we all strengthen those cords that will bind us to our Father in Heaven, who is always there, waiting to bless us, I pray, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Pat. Classes will not begin until 11.15, and we would have you relaxed and aware that we'll have you out in plenty of time. I want my own remarks to be something of an extension of Sister Holland's. I, too, wish to speak to you about our life and our love together as a community, a community bound together with strong ties and common concerns. The quality of your life here, your happiness and your success and your well-being, is constantly on my mind. Certainly it is as we start another school year together. Pat and I want you to be comfortable. We want to know you. We want to be friends. We want you to succeed. We do love you very, very much. Life at BYU is part of a rather large and important experiment in latter-day Christian living. It might even be considered a kind of united order. Surely you are a select group. And as with those pioneer experiments in communal living in Orderville or Brigham City or elsewhere, we are terribly dependent upon each other. The idea is, as I understand it, that we'll live and work very closely together, helping each other, and in the process nudge the institution just that much closer to the ideal university Brigham Young University must be. 
a university full of scholar saints, young and old, who care very much about each other. We want BYU to be at least a little, like heaven must be a lot. Hell, on the other hand, says T.S. Eliot's poem, is oneself. Hell is experienced alone. There is nothing to escape from and nothing to escape to. In hell, one is always alone." Close quote. Now, except for those moments of solitude we all expect and wish for, I am anxious that no one feel needlessly alone at BYU. And in the few minutes I have with you, I hope to suggest a meaning there that goes significantly beyond the mere disappointments of loneliness. I am reaching for a special meaning of friendship. And to the extent that I have either a text or a title, it is taken from the Apocrypha. A faithful friend is a strong defense, and he that hath found one hath found a treasure. I speak to you friend to friend. Last Saturday, three days ago, David McNeese, Jr. was buried. He was 22. He had been married just three weeks. One week ago today, he was standing in the Washington Street Station waiting for a Boston subway train to arrive when another man, screaming, abusive, and obviously very drunk, entered the station, walked to the edge of the platform, and fell onto the tracks. Instantly, and I assume instinctively, 22-year-old, newly married, responsible David McNeese jumped down on the track to help. In that instant, the train came out of the tunnel. McNeese frantically waved his arms, and then, as one observer described it to the press, it was over so quickly. Not surprisingly, the drunken, abusive, fallen man survived the experience quite nicely. And as they buried David McNeese, everyone who knew this young couple called it so needlessly, selfishly senseless. What does that have to do with your first day at school? Nothing, really. And then maybe again everything. Sister Holland mentioned in her remarks some of the invitations I've had recently to speak and tell the BYU story. A rather constant theme in those public speeches has been our commitment to the virtues and values, purposes that have always mattered at universities and in civilized societies, purposes that certainly matter at Brigham Young University. They include, among a host of other things, courage and honor, honesty and integrity. They include good taste and careful speech and hard work. They include sensitivity and spirituality and an appreciation for both art and nature. They include a love of learning and a sense of progression and a sense of peace. They include an awareness of culture and tradition and history, especially history marking what time has shown to be the better way. Why speak of such virtues and values? Well. I happen to be one who thinks BYU has a good deal to say about them to a world that may be losing at least some of them. Furthermore, espousing them is part of what it means to be a Latter-day Saint. So for several of my first months here two years ago, I wrestled with what my highest personal tasks ought to be in relationship to those principles. I finally isolated four, made them the major goals of my administration, and went before the faculty and staff the next fall in our annual university conference telling them what my hopes were and why I thought BYU was a pearl of great price, a gem worth putting on national display. I then shared at least the spirit of those ideas in this assembly with you last year and began in earnest to do all I could to accomplish just four things, to encourage our quest for truth as a university of the first rank, to reinforce our commitment to basic moral values in a university whose light must have a special glow. To tell the BYU story wherever and whenever possible and to extend the sense of community that we have always felt here. Those were and are my four personal tasks as I see them in my part of the BYU mission. Well, some things have worked well. Some things haven't worked so well. And, of course, the task goes on. A lot of days have been fairly long. A few nights have been pretty short. But I've loved it deeply, and Sister Holland has loved it, and our children have loved it, within reason. <laughs> and a lot of other friends on this campus have loved it, 
and have done these things better and longer than the Hollands will ever be able. But we believe in the task and have been blessed immensely and are anxious to do a better job. And from time to time, others around the country have expressed interest in our efforts. Nothing earth-shaking because nothing very earth-shaking was going on. But interest, often genuine interest, in BYU's desire to be a very good university. And I intend that adjective to apply with every possible interpretation. Well, after two years of doing what little we were capable of, usually right here on campus but occasionally in some outside setting, the syndicated services of the Los Angeles Times chose to run a rather complimentary column on BYU's view of these matters of truth and virtue. Perhaps some of you saw it. The story appeared coast to coast. The, story, the copy I saw appeared here on April 21st. Two days later, on Commencement Day, April 23, 1982, these stories appeared in a United Press International release disseminated at least as widely. Even as we marched, robed and hooded, to our graduation exercises. The headlines read, Four Why Students Charged with Fake Document Fraud, Why Students Arraigned on License Scam, and so on, and so on, and so on. By referring to this incident, I do not want to cause anyone any more pain than too many have already felt. I do not use the names of the students involved. I hope you do not even know their names. I would not embarrass them or their parents or you. That is not my purpose. Remember, I am speaking friend to friend. But perhaps enough time has gone by that, at least in the abstract, we can use the lesson it offers as a group of people who have chosen to live together for a time. Virtus et Veritas was the falsifying of government documents. I am reading from the press release verbatim. Was the falsifying of government documents in connection with a highly sophisticated driver license forgery scam operating out of one of the university's dormitories, close quote, was that either virtuous or truthful? Oh, there's a Latin phrase for it, but it isn't virtus et veritas. And what of the 67 individuals known to have ordered the false identification documents, showing those in possession to be 21 years of age when they were not? What need would exist for 67 students on this campus to own a fake ID? Is it that tough ticket taker at the Varsity Theater? <laughs> Is it the dispenser of Y Sparkle at the Cougar Eat? If a Y student's life is getting that tough, we better issue fake IDs to everyone. Perhaps it's the new football stadium. Perhaps there are no seats for any under 21. To students admitted here on their honor, I cannot imagine any other reasons for needing to be 21. And what are the rest of the students in those rooms and on those halls and in those dormitories? Was everyone's education yet so paltry that not one had ever heard Edmund Burke's dictum, all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men and women to do nothing? Did anyone within 45 miles of Hinckley Hall have any pangs of guilt or whisper of conscience knowing that a felony was being committed in facilities paid for and maintained by the tithing dollars of widows and the fatherless? And there we sat in graduation exercises speaking of truth and virtue. It is no wonder to me that God once said to ancient Israel, I despise your feast days, and I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Let me cite one other disappointment and then leave this whole subject. I don't like it any better than you do. Sometime during our life together last year, a very angry and disappointed father called me about his daughter's off-campus living situation. She had at least one roommate who apparently thought her boyfriend should be entitled to spend the night on the couch whenever the evening's weariness overtook him, and apparently most evenings he was overtaken. 
After all, there was nothing really wrong here. It was a little inconvenient in an apartment of girls, but there were walls and doors and robes, and he could pretty much be left alone. Well, I say to this Rip Van Winkle of Riviera or Raintree or wherever, <laughs> and to his girlfriend and to her roommates, men do not sleep in women's apartments if either said man or woman wants to remain at Brigham Young University. Not on the couch, not in the kitchen, not on the floor, not entwined around five-gallon cans containing the next year's supply of whole wheat. <laughs> no one has to be a four-point student to understand that, including the roommates who put up with it. Now I speak of these unsavory issues and leave them. And I do so not to sensationalize mistakes or to rule out the repentance that every one of us will need to call upon forever. I think if this had not been so recent and so devastating to me, I certainly would not choose to begin a New Year's greeting to you this way. I'm certainly not pointing publicly at any individuals, and I'm certainly not inviting you to do so. But what I do want to stress, and this now can be more positive, what I do want to stress on this very first day of the school year is the nature of the covenant society we form when we come to BYU, and that we have a right to hope for when we have enrolled here, that is, among faculty, staff, students, and administrators. We are, at least by the world standards, separatists, just like those earliest pilgrims were, sailing aboard our own Mayflower and determined to live a better way. Like they, we too feel we are on God's errand in the wilderness. On the 11th of November, 1620, when that first courageous little band touched land at Cape Cod, they, like we, signed a compact, quote, for the glory of God, the advancement of the Christian faith, and the general good of the colony, close quote. Every social or political experiment in history has had some such code or compact or constitution, written or implied, Christian or otherwise, upon which it is depended for its very survival and we have one at BYU. Now, the success of our BYU experiment, like that of those first New Englanders, requires the best, everyone, the best effort of everyone whose name is on the parchment. Ben Franklin said it best to the signers of the Declaration 150 years later. He said, We must all hang together to his colonial friends, or assuredly we will all hang separately. The success we dream will take the best efforts of all who come here. It will never work otherwise, at least not fully and at least not well. It won't require abrasiveness or smugness or self-righteousness, but it will, inquire, it will require integrity and it will require work. Is every Christian expected to bear witness? asks George MacDonald. Is every Christian expected to bear witness? A man content to bear no witness to the truth is not in the kingdom of heaven. One who believes must bear witness. One who sees the truth must live witnessing to it. Is our life then a witnessing to the truth? Do we carry ourselves in the bank or the farm, in the house or the shop, in the study or chamber or workshop as the Lord would or as the Lord would not? Are we careful to be true or are we mean, self-serving, world-flattering, fawning slaves? When contempt is cast on the truth, do we smile? When the truth is wronged in our presence, do we make any sign that we hold by it? I do not say, he goes on, that we are called upon to dispute and defend against falsehood with logic and argument. But we are called upon to show that we are on the other side. The soul that loves the truth and tries to be true will know when to speak and when to be silent. But the true man will never look as if he did not care. We are not bound to say all that we think. But we are bound not to even look like what we do not think. Close quote. Well, in the kind of Christian community that we anxiously pursue here, we must not even look like what we do not think or what we do not believe. And we must never look as if we did not care. That's why we make gentle reminders about dress and grooming. 
Every year at the start of school, I see just a few, a very, very few, who have grubby or immodest clothing or hair that isn't trimmed or groomed, and I think, well, we failed, at least early on, to help them understand what it is we're about at BYU. It is a part, however small, of the mission we have, the witness we bear, the colony we're creating. It's part of governing ourselves once correct principles have been taught and understood, and it is important in far more significant ways than dress and grooming, in far more private arenas of our lives. This reminder is, of course, directly applicable to all of us, beginning with the president of the university. If I robbed a bank this afternoon, or worse yet for you, embezzled the university's operating funds, would I be the only one punished? I might be the only one to get a jail sentence, but I wouldn't be the only one punished. No, you and my wife and my children and my colleagues, all of you, all of you would share in the shame and in the burden. BYU and the LDS Church would be severely punished, at least in the public mind, for a long, long time to come. That's unfair, you say. Well, I say what's fair about the death of David McNeese, Jr., 22-year-old newlywed. You see, we are all, in a sense, waiting at the station together. We each have our own hopes and plans and dreams, but by virtue of enrolling at BYU, we've stated at least our basic agreement as to which train we will ride and what special rules of conduct we'll obey as passengers. Of course, a drunk can stagger onto the platform, ride over the edge, and take with him needless, heart-rending, and unfair tragedy to his friends. Certainly not his enemies. His enemies would have left him there. And that can come almost before the trip has even begun. But the risk David McNeese took is the risk we all must take in a Christian community. Should then a faculty member at BYU write or say or teach or publish anything he or she wants and assume that's done without any impact upon colleagues in that department or that college or the university as a whole? Maybe that kind of intellectual isolation exists at some university, but it certainly doesn't exist at BYU. Can a manager on our staff be free with his ledgers or his supplies or his cash or his contracts and believe that he alone runs the risk of exposure? Maybe somewhere, but not at BYU. So it ought not to be any great surprise that we have expectations for you as students as well. There are no victimless crimes here. We do, at least in some very fundamental ways, hold all things in common, as did those early saints. Ask not for whom the old Y bell tolls. It tolls for thee. You don't really need here an introduction to political philosophy 101, and I'm not the one to teach it. But consider this early observation attributed to Socrates by Plato. Mankind at first lived dispersed, and there were no cities. Read universities, if you wish. But the consequence was that they were destroyed by wild beasts. That has a lot of meaning, I think, for us. And they were utterly weak in comparison to them, and their art was only sufficient to provide them with the means of life and did not enable them to carry out war against these animals. Food they had, but not as yet any art of government, of which the art of defense is a part. After a while, the desire of self-preservation gathered them into cities or universities, but when they were gathered together, having no art of government, they evil entreated one another and were again in process of dispersion and destruction. Well, Zeus feared that the entire race would be exterminated, so he sent Hermes to them, bearing reverence and justice to be the ordering principles of cities and the bonds of friendship and conciliation. Well, Zeus may not have sent Hermes, but Brigham Young did send Carl G. Mazur that we might learn to live together in the bonds of friendship and conciliation, whether out of a desire for self-preservation like the Greeks or for the general good of the colony noted by the pilgrims, 
part of our education is to learn, wise, li learn to live wisely and responsibly together. Hell is being alone and self-centered and untrue. If enough understood that soon enough, and thus cherished rather than chafed under the human bonds that must be formed, then the whole world could be saved in something of a celestial colony, both here in time as well as in eternity. Now many of you, indeed most of you, make BYU just such a community of friends right now. I reluctantly speak of two or three or even sixty-seven who have problems during a year because I do so with the full realization that more than 25,000 of you are contributing to the common good at BYU and are, at least for the tasks at hand, as heroic in your way as David McNeese was in his. I think no students anywhere in this world live the lives of responsibility and example that you do at BYU. I salute you with all my heart. And you who are new today become part of a rare and rich tradition. Now we began by singing the school song. The words to that song were written by an early student at BYU, Annie Pike Greenwood. In 1909, as a non-member of the Church, she also wrote something else, a brief testimonial in response to one of her friends who had said, I think they must have spoiled you at Brigham Young. Reflecting on that comment, Annie wrote, It struck me forcibly that he was right. They had certainly spoiled me at Brigham Young, spoiled me as a mother spoils her child, with kindness, encouragements, appreciation, and charity, spoiled me so that I can never be content to take anything but the best the world has to give, nor satisfied to give anything but the best that lies within me. By day and by night it comes upon me that I must fulfill all of which my teachers believe me capable." Close quote. Well, what is the best that lies within us? Of how much are we capable? None of us knows, but that is part of the reason we have come to BYU. An old Arabic legend tells of a rider finding a spindly sparrow lying on his back in the middle of the road. He dismounted and asked the sparrow why his feet were in the air. Well, replied the sparrow, I heard the heavens were going to fall today. And I suppose you think your puny bird legs can hold up the whole universe, laughed the horseman. Perhaps not, said the sparrow with conviction, but one does whatever one can. In my appreciation for you, I suppose it is only fair to note that some of you probably do whatever you can in ways we might not fully encourage. <clears throat> President Dallin Oaks told me of an experience early in his administration. A prominent visitor to the campus was being hosted at a luncheon in the Wilkinson Center when he excused himself to visit the men's room. When the visitor returned, he looked dark and said with a tone of disappointment, Well, I've discovered you Mormons are just like everybody else. When I go to a public restroom, I usually find things written on the walls, and BYU is no exception. His totally abashed BYU hosts immediately tried to, ex to extend an apology, however lame, but as they stammered and stuttered, he burst out laughing. Don't worry, he said. It was confined to just one bold handwritten word, repent. <laughs> <clears throat> Perhaps the author of that was the fellow with the surfboard. Uh, we have all come to BYU for the general good of the colony, and you make it a wonderful place to be. Sister Holland and I love you with all our hearts. We thank you for the gift you've given us. I said at the outset that I wanted to speak of friendship in a way that transcended mere companionship. We do not want you to be lonely here, but more than that, we do not want you to be false. Of all who will one day stand in dismay, dis, in dismay and sickness of heart, with the consciousness that their very existence is a shame, those will fare the worst who have been consciously false to their friends, who, pretending friendship, have used their neighbor to their own ends, and especially those who, pretending friendship, have divided friends. To such Dante has given 
the lowest circle in hell. If there be one thing God hates, surely it must be treachery. I ask you to care for each other the way the David McNeeses of the world care. Don't play the part of the drunk. Leave BYU months or years from now better than you found it. Study hard. Make every semester count. You are here for an education. Like little Annie Greenwood, give the best that lies within you. This is no easy task. It is no convenient colonial duty. It will require much from you, and faithful friends are indeed a strong defense. I love you and welcome you back to school. You are my friends, Jesus said to his disciples, and with his own life gave them the love of which he said there is no greater. You are my friends, he said, if you do whatsoever I command you. These things I command you, that ye love one another. May this be the very best and the friendliest year of our lives, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.